Good morning, I'm Sean and I'm so excited to be here with you. If you're watching us for the first time, I'd like to invite you to fill out our Connect card. We'd love a chance to get to connect with you and get to know you a little bit. This morning, in our in-person services, we're celebrating all of our graduating high school seniors. We are so excited for them in their next chapter and can't wait to see where God is calling them to. So this morning, let's put away our distractions and let's go to God. God, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for these incredible seniors. We thank you for this incredible community. God, go be with us this morning and speak to us. In Christ's name I pray.
Well, hello, I want to add my welcome to The Village Online. So glad you're here with us today. My name is Travis. I'm one of the pastors here at The Village, and uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm going to introduce a video that we're going to watch here in just a minute. About six weeks before Easter, we started an initiative to raise money for one of our partner organizations, Water 4, to do some water projects in Sierra Leone and in Uganda. During the month of March, I actually got to go to Uganda myself and to see the work that was happening there, and I was absolutely blown away uh, by the good work that Water 4 is doing on the ground there in Uganda. And so uh, I want you to watch this video about the work that's happening there, and then when we come back, I'm going to announce our total for our offering. So check out this video. While we've been here, we've been seeing like people lined up in these drainage ditches, scooping water into jerry cans where there aren't NUMA systems. And so the contrast of like, brown, dirty ditch water <laughs> to the UV treated yeah. piped water is mind boggling. Probably in the next couple of months, we'll not have people getting this dirty water. People will be drinking safe water. And that's what Numa is doing. I'm Travis Garner. I am from Nashville, Tennessee. I'm the lead pastor at the Village Church. Started working with Water 4 in 2017, so about six years ago. And uh, we've, we've given away our Easter offering every year to Water 4. And so, um, you know, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so I wanted to follow my heart. And Matt, Matt invited me to, to come and see what was going on here and um, I've loved getting to see what we've been seeing in pictures for the past six years. Hi, I'm Matt Hangen, I'm president and CEO of Water4, and we're in Uganda, and this is my first time to see a new startup called Forward East Africa. And we're here touring Mayuge district, where we're planning on bringing water to 600,000 people here. And not just water, but piped water, that's UV treated and chlorinated, and delivered to people's homes and communities that are primarily farmers and fishermen that earn about $3 a day. So NUMA is a, is a branded pipe water project and we use one well to distribute water to thousands of people. We pump out of the well, we treat it, and then we distribute it to storage tanks that then go to homes, schools, and healthcare clinics. People pay for the water through prepaid meters and that payment supports the business that drilled and installed that system so they can make sure it runs forever. And then yesterday we got to drive out to several villages and communities where uh, the Numa Nexus systems are going in or, and, and have, have been going in. And um, so seeing the actual impact there that's happening and seeing how quickly that's changing the community, uh, getting to drink from the water myself uh, was, a, was a really, I don't know, that was a huge high for me just to I, I said it was the best water I've ever had in my life. That's so good. That is so good. <laughs> and now we are feeling comfortable. You know how clean we are, how smart we are, now we are feeling. We are taking even clean water than you people. That's right. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then I'm very proud about it. It's really exciting. Uh, we want to bring water to this entire district. There's 600,000 people here. And so we're approaching it uh, that way. We're thinking big. We want to bring safe water of course, bringing the gospel through our work and our employees uh, in every moment of engagement. And uh, I'm really excited to get to, to witness this new venture with Water4. Honestly, I can't think of a better organization in terms of how Water4 is structured, their focus on discipleship, multiplication, bringing real water and living water, and, and the partnership of all of those things together is a really unique partnership. and and how they're empowering people in the local communities is a, is a very unique thing. And so um, this trip has made me want to invest even more in Water 4 and in Forward here. And this is setting up generational impact that's going to impact people uh, for generations to come, uh, both in terms of their, their physical lives, their physical health, but also their spiritual lives as well. Scotty, 
Amadi no Bulamu. Water is life. Maybe Everything needs water. No one song, Thank you for identifying that you are the people in this world. May God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. What cool things are happening there and that you are part of through your generosity and through your giving. And so I am really, really, really excited uh, to just give this number today that we set a $50,000 goal and collectively you gave $87,136. At least as of, the, as of right now, that's what you've given. You may have given more, who knows, but $87,000. $136, and I just want to thank you, and I want to thank God uh, for doing that uh, through you. It's going to make such a tremendous impact to real people that I got to meet in the Entebbe district in Uganda, and so I'm so excited to get to be part of this with you. Hey, I want to pray for us today, um, so let's pray. God, thank you so much for who you are, for the ways that you're at work. I thank you for the collective generosity of the people in our church. It just blows me away that you've moved in such a way in our hearts and spirits that uh, we've exceeded our, our goal like this. It's absolutely amazing. So we pray for everything that we're going to be giving to water for, that it would just be used to spread and multiply your goodness on the ground there among real people, that they would, number one, uh, they'd experience clean water and it would change the physical life that they live. But God, also that it would be an avenue to, to the living water that Jesus provides. Um, we pray for the team that's there right now, um, the local people who work there for Water 4 who are doing this work, and we just pray for your blessing on them. God, I pray today um, also that you would, uh, you would speak. You'd speak right now uh, through me or in spite of me, something that each and every one of us needs to hear. So we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So for anybody who's tracking, who's been with us uh, tracking through the Gospel of Luke this year, um, I'm happy to report that as of today, we are a third of the way through the Gospel of Luke. We started last November and we're just going uh, chapter by chapter, verse by verse through the Gospel of Luke. And as of today, we flip to chapter 9 and we're a third of the way through the Gospel. So I want to read this from Luke chapter 9. Uh, a couple maybe familiar stories, especially the second one. So just hear these words now from, from Luke. Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 1, says, When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. This is what he told them. Take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt, Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, just leave their town and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. And so they set out and went from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. Now Herod, who was the, the tetrarch, it says, Herod was the government official, the ruler. He heard about all that was going on. And he was perplexed because some people were saying that John the Baptist, who he beheaded, had been raised from the dead, and others that Elijah had appeared, the great prophet Elijah from the Old Testament, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago had come back to life. But Herod said, I beheaded John. Who then is this I hear such things about? And he tried to see him. The story goes on. It says, when the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. And so then he took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a, a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it, and they followed him. And so he welcomed them, and he spoke to them about the kingdom of God, and he healed those who needed healing. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and, and countryside and find food and lodging, because we're in a remote place here. But Jesus replied to them, You give them something to eat. They answered, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish, unless we go and buy food for all this crowd. It says there were about 5,000 men who were there. But he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 people each. And so the disciples did so, and everybody sat down. 
taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and he broke them. And then he gave to the disciples, then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. This is a turning point in the gospel. So up until this point, the first eight chapters, everything really has been for Jesus and the disciples. It's been about, hey, come and see. Like, hey, hey, come and see. Come, come and check me out. Come and check out what's going on. And come and follow. I want you to follow. I want you to learn from me. I want you to see what I do. I want you to see if you can learn how to do what I do. But now, at this point, at this turning point of the gospel, a third of the way through, it's becoming go and do. It's gone from come and see to come and follow, and now it's becoming go and do. And so Jesus gathers the disciples together, and he sends them out to do two things. Proclaim the kingdom of God and heal the sick. He tells them to do those two things. Proclaim the kingdom of God and heal the sick. Now, Jesus sent the twelve out because there was... There was no other means of communication in that day and time. And so it was time for the message and the method and the mission of Jesus to begin to spread all along the countryside. And so Jesus began to send them out uh, to kind of go on this grand adventure of proclaiming the kingdom of God and healing the sick. And clearly it was effective because it caused such such a fuss in the area that Herod, who was the government official, probably sitting in his palace somewhere, he began to hear rumors and rumblings of these things that were happening, and it made him think that something significant, spiritually significant, was happening in the countryside around him. Now, I think it's really important to point out in this that that this ministry that Jesus sent the disciples out to do, it combined preaching, preaching the kingdom of God, and healing, healing the sick. It combined both the, the physical needs of people and the spiritual needs of people, right? This was, this was something that, that Jesus wasn't saying, hey, I don't just want you to go out in words. I want you to go out in actions. I don't, I don't just want you to go out and talk about it. I want you to go out and talk about it, but I also want you to go out and do it. Some, sometimes in our culture, uh, especially within Christianity, there's this divide between people who are all about the words of Jesus but not necessarily the actions of Jesus. And then there are some people who are all about the actions of Jesus, but not necessarily the words of Jesus. And Jesus is saying, hey, I care about both of these things. And when you go out, I want you to speak the words, proclaiming the kingdom of God, and I want you to do the actions, to heal the sick, to bring healing, physical healing to people who are sick. Uh, it's, it's possible to overstress one over the other, but Jesus is really finding this common ground between the two, which tells us that Jesus cares very much about our spiritual needs. Jesus cares about your spiritual needs. And Jesus cares very much about physical needs. He cares very much about your physical needs. Jesus still wants and needs people who are willing to go out and share his words and also to go out, also to go out and, and become part of his mission to do the deeds that he did. Uh, but there's, there's a, another interesting thing to point out in the story. Jesus says to them, take nothing for the journey. No staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. Take nothing for the journey. Don't take anything extra with you. I think there's an important principle at work here for the disciples and for us, and it's simply this. Whatever you already have is enough for what God is asking you to do. Whatever you already have is enough for what God is asking you to do. Like what you already have plus what God already has is more than enough to do what God is asking you to do. And, and, and to be clear, what God is asking you to do and me to do and all of us to do Right? It's what God is asking everybody to do. It's what God is asking the disciples to do in this story. It's what Jesus has continued to ask us to do throughout the centuries. There might be some specificity to it for you. There might be some specifics about your particular role in the kingdom of God or in sharing the kingdom of God. There might be some variation on it based on where you are in life and what your particular skills are. But ultimately, it's the same mission for each and every one of us. Proclaim the kingdom of God, speak of the things of God, tell about Jesus with your words, and heal the sick. Do the deeds of God. Use the methods of Jesus. Participate in the mission of Jesus with who you are and with what you do. It's words and actions. Uh, After a service a few weeks ago, 
somebody came up to me, uh, one of our teenagers in, in the church came up to me and said, uh, said, hey, good sermon to you today. And I looked back and I just said, good sermon to you today. And, and she responded, she goes, oh, no, 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 I didn't sermon. I didn't serm, which I didn't know that was a verb, but I, I kind of like it. And I, I said, are you kidding me? You serm every day. You serm every day, right? I only serm one day a week. You serm on the other six. And, and I, what I was trying to communicate is that what you do, what you do out there in sharing the message of Jesus and living the mission of Jesus has way more impact and influence than what I do on Sunday mornings. Are you familiar with Dunbar's number? Uh, Dunbar's number was created by a social scientist back in the 90s, the 1990s. And, um, and basically, uh, through a study of, of primates and brain structure and, and uh, kind of social structure, uh, Dunbar said that the human being's capacity for relationships is somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 people. So as a human being, you can, you can maintain relationships with somewhere around 150 people. There's actually been more recent research on this that's beginning to debunk Dunbar's number and to say that's actually not nearly high enough. And so there's a, a more recent study uh, that showed the average number of, of relationships that, that humans have in their social networks is 652 I'm not people. Sure I understand. 652 people. So here's the thing. On a regular Sunday morning here at the village, on average, I connect with about 500 people. We have about 500 people that attend our services on an average Sunday morning right now. What that means is that during the week, if Dunbar's number is correct, where I connect with 500 people, you connect with 75,000 people. That's at the low end. If the more recent studies are correct, and it's, it's more like 652, that means that, that the 500 of us who gather together on Sunday mornings, during the week, that means that you connect with 326,000 people. The 500 people that connect here on Sunday mornings, during the week, you all go out and you connect with 326,000 people. That means that you connect with 325,500 more people every week collectively than I do on a Sunday morning. What you do matters. Like who you are matters. This, uh, this weekend, we're celebrating our seniors in worship, we're having our seniors come forward and their, their parents and we're praying for them and kind of sending them out with a prayer of commissioning. And I just want you to know, if you're going to college next year, you're actually increasing your sphere of influence. You've got a certain sphere of influence right now where you can make an impact with the words and the actions of Jesus. But as you go to college next year, you're increasing your circle. You're increasing your sphere of influence. And I'll just tell you, you can go, you can choose to go as somebody who's passive you can choose to go and just become somebody who is influenced, or you can go with the mindset of I'm going as a missionary from God and I'm being sent to make an influence in the lives of other people. It's a choice for you, right? You can allow the Holy Spirit to work through you in such a way that you become an influence on your campus in a new way. It's a choice that you can make. It's a choice that you can make. And I want to say to all of us, the sermons that you preach out in the community through your words and through your actions in your normal everyday life, in your normal interactions at work, on the sidelines, in the grocery store, they have much more powerful of an impact and an effect than anything I do in here on a Sunday. You are significant and Jesus is sending you out with his message, with his methods, and with his mission. If you skip down in the story, you jump down the page, there's some similar factors at work here and similar principles at work here in the story of the feeding of the 5,000. The disciples come back. They've gone, on this, they've gone on this mission trip. They come back. Jesus intends to take them on a retreat where they can kind of debrief what's been happening there with them. And, and what happens is the crowds follow because the crowds, they just... They're just longing to be around Jesus. They're longing to hear about the kingdom of God and they're longing to be healed. That same thing is true for us today. People in our culture, they are hungry for the kingdom of God. They are hungry for healing. They are hungry for the, the message of Jesus. They are hungry for the mission of Jesus to come alive in them and through them and around them. And that's what happens in this story. And so the crowds follow Jesus and the disciples. And Jesus looks at them and he says these words, they're hungry. It's late in the afternoon. You give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. 
And the disciples say, we have no, we can't do that. We have no idea. There's not enough food here. We'd have to go buy a bunch of food. There's no way we can do that. And Jesus, Jesus demonstrates that he has multiplicative power in this story. And he has everyone sit down and he takes the five loaves of bread and the 12 little pieces of fish, probably like sardines. And he prays and they're multiplied. And it says the whole crowd is fed and the gospels tell us that there were leftovers. Right? The multiplicative power is so strong that when, when we put into the hands of Jesus the things that we have, even when we think they're small and insignificant, Jesus has the power of multiplication and they can become more than anything we could ever imagine and they can meet more needs of more people than we could ever imagine. We actually have some amazing people in our church right now who have taken these words from Jesus seriously. The words of Jesus where Jesus said, you give them something to eat. And we have people who have started backpack feeding programs in some of our local schools. And we have people who've started collecting food from some of our local businesses and local grocery stores on Saturday mornings to distribute them. And what you may not know is through, uh, through the power of God and the work of about five people in our church, a thousand people, kids and families, every week, are getting food in a way that they haven't been given before. Literally a thousand people every week in our community. It's happening through your generosity. Like you're funding the backpack programs through your regular giving and people are being fed. And it's through the, the work and the willingness of these people in our church to just simply step in in faith and say, what do you want me to do now, God? We sense a need uh, a hunger, a literal physical hunger among people in our community, and we want to meet that. And because of you, there are a thousand people getting fed every week because people took Jesus seriously when he said, I want you to go. I want you to proclaim the kingdom of God. I want you to heal the sick and meet the physical needs of people. You give them something to eat. And that's happening. That's happening right now. I get excited to think about what might happen if every single one of us stepped in with the things that we have and we began to give those generously to God. What could happen in our community? What could happen in your life? What could happen in your family if you began to, to really institute these words from Jesus into your life? Go with my message. Go with my methods. Go with my mission. Take what you have and give it to me and allow me to multiply it. There are a lot of ghost stories throughout the Bible. There are a lot of stories where, uh, where God sends people to go. God comes with people and gives them a message to go and to do. Or where Jesus sends people out. He sends the disciples out. A lot of stories. God, God said to Abraham, one of the earliest ones in the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 12, God said to Abraham, I want you to go from your place right now where you're living in your homeland and your family. And I want you to go to the place that I'll show you. And I'm going to bless you. And if you're obedient to me in this, if you go, your family will multiply. And that family, through that family, the whole earth will be blessed. And it was through that family line that Jesus was born. It was through that family line, that one act of obedience of Abraham going from his homeland to another country that he'd never been to before and simply saying, God, I'll, I'll do what you want me to do. I'll go where you want me to go. And through that family line that Jesus came to save and redeem every person on earth. Jesus said to his disciples at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, he said, I want you to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And remember, I'm with you to the very end of the age. There's stories like that all throughout Scripture. But one of my favorites is the story of Moses in the book of Exodus chapter 3. When God, God comes to Moses, Moses is a shepherd. He's out in the wilderness, like this desolate wilderness, He's tending his sheep. He's just a shepherd. He's carrying a shepherd's staff like shepherds did. He's kind of walking around out there by himself, just a man and his sheep, hanging out in the wilderness. And God comes to him and he says to him this, Moses, I want you to go from where you are right now in the wilderness tending these sheep. I want you to go to the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh, and I want you to tell him, let my people go. The Israelite people had been enslaved in Egypt and it says that God God heard their cry, God became concerned about them, and God decided to act. And in that moment, he sent Moses. Well, Moses wasn't willing to go. And I love the story because I can relate to it so much. Moses begins to give God a lot of excuses about why he can't go, about why he's not the guy. God says, go, and, and Moses is like, hey, super cool. 
that you're asking me to go. Uh, you know, you're kind of talking to me out of a burning bush and everything. Super cool how you did that, God, but I don't think I'm your guy. I think I'm the wrong guy. God responds to him, no problem. No problem, Moses. I'll go with you. Moses says, yeah, what if I go to them and they're like, uh, and I'm like, hey, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you. And they're, you know, they say back, well, what's his name? Prove it to us. And so God responds to him, no problem. Here's my name. Here's what you can tell them. They go through this whole list of excuses. God answers every single one of them. And Moses ends, I love this. Moses ends the, the interaction by saying, pardon me, Lord, please send someone else, right? Anybody ever felt like that? Like, pardon me, Lord, I got this inkling to do something, but please send somebody else. Please send somebody else. I don't want to go. In the middle of the interaction, this is a powerful, powerful piece of this interaction. In the middle of the interaction, Moses says, what if they don't believe me? And God asked Moses this question. What if they don't believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? And it says, the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? Moses, remember, he's a shepherd. He's out in the wilderness. What does he have in his hand? He's got a shepherd's staff, just a, probably a stick. It's like a walking stick. And Moses says, well, it's a staff. And the Lord said, throw it on the ground. Throw it on the ground. And the story in Exodus says, Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. And then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And so Moses, being braver than I would be, reached out and he took hold of the snake and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. If you read through the story of Exodus and, and, and Numbers and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, uh, you see that it's almost like the staff of Moses, this stick, his walking stick, it's almost like it becomes its own character in the story. If Disney were to do a remake of the story of Moses, I, like the staff would have its own song. So it would have a solo that it would sing somewhere in the story. I'm convinced of that because it takes on this role as a primary character. So as you read the story, as Moses leads the people out of Egypt, he raises up the staff. And when he raises up this stick, the Red Sea parts and the people are able to walk through the Red Sea. One day, the, the uh, Israelite people are in this battle with the Amalekites. And, and Moses finds that when he raises up this walking stick, this staff, when he raises it up in the air, the Israelites are winning the battle that's in front of them. And when he lowers it back down, the Israelites find that they're losing the battle. And so there's actually a story where uh, Miriam and Aaron, who are Moses' siblings, they surround him on either side and they hold up his arm for him when his arm gets tired. And because of that, the people win the battle that they're facing. There, there's another story where they're out in the wilderness and the people are thirsty and they don't have any water. And God says to Moses, use your staff and strike this rock out in the middle of nowhere and water will come out of it. And so Moses does, he takes this walking stick he whacks the rock and suddenly water gushes out of the rock and the people have clean water to drink. But here's the thing about the staff. There was nothing magical about the staff. It was literally a stick, a walking stick, a shepherd's staff. It's just what he used to walk around the desert and maybe whack an animal who was trying to attack his sheep from time to time. It was an ordinary piece of wood that Moses had in his hand. But the power came when Moses realized that he could surrender an ordinary thing to the multiplicative power of God. And that's when the miraculous began to happen. Moses, Moses learned something that we can learn as well. What you have, whatever it is that you have, can play a crucial role in the story of God if you'll simply give it to God. Whatever you have, whatever you have, God can multiply it and it can play a crucial role in the story of God if you'll simply surrender it to God. That's the crazy thing about how God operates, about how God partners with us. And it starts with that question from God to us. God looks at us and asks the same question. What's in your hand? What is that that's in your hand? What do you have right now? What resources do you have at your disposal right now? What gifts and abilities do you have right now? What knowledge and expertise do you have right now? What passion do you have right now? What's in your hand? What is it that you have? Even something that you think is ordinary. What do you have? that you could simply surrender and lay down before God and see what God does with that. 
And if you do that, you should prepare to be blown away. Jesus said to the disciples, I want you to go, but don't take anything extra with you. Why? Because whatever you have, whatever you already have, is enough for God to do what God wants to do. The disciples said, we just got five loaves and 12 fishes. It's not enough to feed this huge crowd of 5,000 people. And Jesus said, no big deal. Just have the crowd sit down. Give me the loaves and fishes. Why? Because Jesus has the power and the ability and the willingness to multiply ordinary resources to do miraculous things. Moses is just carrying around a stick, a staff that he's probably found laying on the ground, a dead tree limb, and he's walking around with it. And it does the miraculous. Why? Because he simply surrenders it to God and allows God to do what God's going to do with it. What do you have? What do you have? What are your financial resources that you have that you could give to God and see what God does with it? What are your talents and abilities, your expertise, your experiences? What do you have? What are the ordinary things at your disposal? What's your story? What is it that you have that you could give to God? And so I want to pray for us today. I want to invite you to pray with me. If you'd close your eyes and just take a deep breath. And I want you to think about that question. I want you to imagine right now that God is asking you that question. What is that in your hand? What is that in your hand? What resources do you have that you could give and surrender in a new way? What talents or abilities or areas of passion has God given you that you've been keeping to yourself? but you could lay them down before God right now. What experiences in your life do you have? And maybe even the most painful experiences in your life, but could now become something miraculous in the hands of God because God's doing a redeeming work in you. What do you have? What could you lay down? What could you give to God right now? So God, we pray right now for the courage to give you whatever it is that we have. Help us to simply lay it down to allow you to be a multiplier with what we have. We pray that because we've given you what we have, we pray that people would be fed. We pray that people would be healed. We pray that more and more people would have clean water. We pray that the physical lives of the people in our community would be drastically changed because of what we've given to you. And God, we pray, we pray for the spiritual life of our community. That because we're willing to give our words to you and to speak about you and to share our story of what you're doing in our lives, we pray that the spiritual lives of people in our families, in our community, on our campuses, where we work, where we cheer on our kids, we pray that the whole cultural landscape, the spiritual cultural landscape would change because of our willingness to give you what we have. So God, we thank you for Jesus who has the power to multiply. So today, God, multiply our impact. Multiply your love in us and through us. Help us to be the kind of people who give you whatever it is that we have. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
the cross All my shame was met with mercy Now your mercy will be my song And all the glory Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Again, if you're new here, we'd love to connect with you. Please take just a minute and fill out our connect card so that we can get to know you a little bit better. We're so very grateful that you took time out of your day to join us this morning. It is because of your generosity that we are able to provide resources like Village Youth to help lead our students in maturing their faith. If you're looking to take a next step and partner with us financially, you can, go, you can do so by going to thevillagenashville.com slash give. As you go into your week, know that our staff is always praying for you. But if you have specific prayer requests that you would like to share with us, you can email them to prayer at thevillagenashville.com. Let's close our morning in prayer. God, we thank you. We thank you for this place, this community, and we thank you for your love and compassion. Go with us like you're going to go with these seniors as they start this next chapter. Speak to us and help us answer our call on our life. In Christ's name, I pray.